thanks very much. Uh, I think that what's interesting about what you presented is that um, one finds in neo-Bogotsky literature a lot a kind of denial that Bogotsky has any notion of stages of development. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. And so I think it's, it's a very interesting kind of um, chasing for us of what you actually said. Um, and I wonder if you could comment on um, the similarities or differences that you see in Vygotsky's notion of these stages with um, crises and other kind of stage development models like the Pugetian model. Oh, look, uh, I really don't know all that much about Pia Piaget, and I know that any room for, you know, child psychologists would be at least 50% of who are. So I, I, I'm not in a position to make that contrast. Um, you have gathered from a couple of my asides that it's very markedly and obviously in the Marxist tradition, okay? And, and therefore, a Hegelian tradition, and there's quite a bit of Goethe in there as well. Uh, that these sort of concepts of structural change which usually the secondary literature said, ah, oh, Vygotsky was studying the Gestalt psychologists. This is completely wrong, because uh, Vygotsky's word in this respect about the Gestalt psychologists is that they, oh, let's try and get it right, they, they exposed the atom and discovered and replaced it with a molecule. Right? They discovered that, that you know, understanding things as atoms you know, isn't sufficiently Gestalt, so they settled for the molecule. Now, the, I've referred a number of times here to the Gestalt being the child with the uh, social environment, the carers or whatever, taken as a whole. And as a whole form of life, which involves everyone, and the whole thing has to be transformed. And I think that approach to human development, uh, which includes the individual, it's not just some broad structural observation, uh, and also it's not an individualist kind of conception. It inextricably takes a person together with the way their needs are met. I mean, if you're wondering who's included in the family, you're talking about how uh, a child's needs are met. So I think that's unique. Um, also, as far as I know, uh, we've got to make no claim that these stages went on continuing through life. So uh, in my own mind, uh, it seems to write, sometimes you mention the crisis at 17, sometimes not. Right? Um, but there's no crisis beyond that age. And of course, what adulthood meant in 1920 the Soviet Union would be so different from here and now. But um, I find that very uh, easy to reconcile with because it corresponds to what my favorite person, Hegel, says. Hegel, uh, in, in a couple of his works, sees stages of development with these traumatic leaps and changes in between up to a point. But once you get to a point, where in a sense that the person's kind of discovered themselves. Yeah? There's a personality there. Not you know, like a, a teenager who, uh, whose personality is very under, underdeveloped and abstract. They've, they've got beliefs, but they can't really stick up for them in a fight, so to speak. What happens for the rest of your life then is a concretization of that. It's a completely different process than the series of, of overthrows that the uh, poor child has to go through to get to that sort of critical point of saying, yeah, I'm here, I vote, I'm an adult, I'm going out to get a job, and so on. Don't know much, but you know, they're, they're on the voters' register, so to speak. But from then on is learning things deeper. Uh, so, sorry about Piaget. You'll have to tell us about that. Or where, where's Ian? Ian? Ian can tell us about that. Uh, he's not here. Okay, yeah, anyone else? Yes. Yes. <laughs> Could well be. He was preparing for the Moscow trials at the time. That might have been his midlife crisis in the Saturday. Um, what you said about the thing to do sequence, I think that's what you said about the thing to do separation. Um, Sorry? The separation between thinking and doing. Oh, yeah. Thinking and doing, yes, yes. I don't know if you could talk a little bit more about that and how, if the guys can talk about how this all happened. It seems such a crucial thing, um, where you said that it's the beginning of reflective thinking. Okay. Um, it's, it's, can I put it? It's not an open shut question, as well. I've had lots of uh, discussions with people really trying to clarify exactly what it means and at what point 
you know, what is really separate, what you know, does it entail, does this mean the kid doesn't know how to tell a lie, uh, or is that not the critical thing, is it the metacognition, and various things. Now, first thing I can say is there's the URL for the <coughs> crucial section of the problem of age that I've been uh, resting on, and it's available on the web, uh, and uh, that's a good start. And if you don't get your answer there, there's the rest of volume five, which I understand is in your library, or will be when Carol returns it. Um, now, the separation of um, thinking from behaviour. Um, so if you're in a situation where I uh, think, pick up book, you do it. Right? So there's no mediation between the thought and the act. In, in a sense, the, it's almost like the thought isn't there, because it's undifferentiated from behaviour. It's like a kind of reflection, a shadow of behaviour. Right? In order to control your behaviour, you have to differentiate them. You have to be able to sit there and have a thought. I wonder what I'll do today. Yeah? Intervening or mediating between going out and doing something. Right? <coughs> uh, also necessary before you can reflect on your thoughts. In fact, it's like one step further and say, you know, um, you know I think a stage later than that, before you're able to do acts like, um, I, s I got out of that by uh, lying to my mother. Was that a good idea? Uh, and actually reflecting on your own behaviour. Uh, I think that's another step ahead. But the first thing is there has to be a separation between your thinking, in the sense of you know, able to listen to yourself, uh, and the actual doing it. It's not, you're not really a conscious human being when to think is to do. It has to be a separation. So it means the, the, the development of, of the intellect as a, a distinct function. See, when the child is, is very, un, very young and undeveloped, it can do lots of things. It's inherited straight from its animal biology. Uh, wonderful, you know, magical tricks. But the thing is that, that for instance, memory, you, you're born with certain uh, uh, you know, cells and, and fun, you know, biological functions in your brain from, mem from remembering. And other animals have the same thing. And you can remember a certain amount of it. But the uh, first thing is it's quite limited. Nowhere enough to get you through human society. So it's only when it's joined with the intellect uh, and you uh, remember by thinking yeah, and then you're using symbols, you can do it. Now the thing is that, that requires, in order to um, uh, control your memory and be able to memorise things and commit things to memory, the memory has to be differentiated out of the whole. So long as it's just an automatic biological function uh, and it's not separated, as for instance, it is when it's connected to the intellect, you can't control it. You remember it or you don't, that's it. Right? But in order to be able to use symbols to control your memory and expand the point where you can read a book with thousands and thousands of words you know, that you haven't seen for a month of Sundays and get right through it. I mean, it's revolving memory, but it isn't sort of memory, it's not like memorizing, because your memory is continually being activated by perception thanks to your intellect. Yeah? Um, so you, all the basic functions reappear at a later stage of development, not as biological functions sort of situated in a certain part of the brain, but as combination of, combinations of these different functions that where you have a kind of a, uh, a reconstructed memory, which is connected to perception, intellect, motor movements, and so on. So the memory then, in a sense, it's, it's separate to start with, but you can't control it separately because it's just an automated biological function. When it's reconstructed at a higher level, it's actually integrated into the entirety of the psyche, but that gives you um, voluntary control over it. You can say, I know how to memorise, I put things in alphabetical order, whatever, something, yeah? You can control it. Does that help? Yeah, I understand what you, you're driving at there. But there's no doubt at all. I mean, I think it's kind of juvenile to try and claim that nothing changes within the organism when you learn something. It's just nonsense. How can you 
that you can't explain anything if one just says, oh, it's all in the social relations. Clearly, however you, it, it happens from the point of view of biology, uh, we have we develop uh, abilities, you know, like you can run fast, that's not a social relation in itself, though of course it's meaningfulness, it's rewards, the ability to practice, uh, motivation for it, all sorts, everything around it is developed um, socially, but still we know that if you've got long legs and big muscles and not too much fat, you run fast, especially for practice. Okay, thinking. Um, so Bogotsky understands that, that thinking is, is, is an activity of people, but it's only within uh, social relations. You know? you, 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 a human being utterly on their own can't think. You know? To the extent that you might be momentary on your own, you're using words which you've acquired in the course of your development, which uh, have restructured your, your brain, so to speak, um, through their sound and their sight and their meaning, their attachment to other people and association with experience. So all the content and form of your um, thinking apparatus, your psyche, is imported from outside. And Vygotsky says somewhere, everything that goes on within the psyche previously happened socially. Okay? Now, to understand the process, um, I mean, it's possible to talk about uh, someone's mind possible to talk about some of social relation. It's not absolutely ruled out that you can't make these objects of you know, interest and discussion. It's not against the rule to, you know, to think of this one and that one. But to understand them, you have to take them as a gestalt. Thought is incomprehensible outside of the system of inexplicable and meaningless outside of a specific uh, activity, system of, of actions uh, organised around uh, cultural products. Um, artifacts, words for example. Yeah. That do it? So what that means for the child who's trying to grow up, it's not of course it's growing up, but a child that's growing up is that, that they can make a certain development but since you know they only know their past life it's very limited, it has to be actualized. You know what I mean by this term actualized? It's like I've got an idea but I, I can't quite picture it. But if you have an opportunity to actualise it, even on a small scale, or maybe do a drawing, or talk about it with someone else, put into words, hear those words, hear someone else's reaction, if something becomes part of the world, it begins to take definite form. And that's absolutely essential for that function, that idea, that activity, that thought to develop. So um, that actualisation is uh, where even the most private thought, if it's going to develop, uh, enters into the relation between you and other people and so on. Right? So that word actualization I think is important to understand the development. Okay? Yes? When you're talking about memory, right, in two different kinds of things, thank you. Yeah, you're talking about memory, memory. Oh. When you were talking about memory as a, as a simple biological function, and then memory um, in, in the context of intellect, coming into it, how then would you put animals and humans and their different use of memory into that? Uh, well, to the overwhelming degree, I won't say all the time because some of them nowadays, well, there was this professor in Tucson who made a monkey do this or something. Okay, but to an overwhelming extent, uh, memory in animals is, is a built-in, biologically hardwired process. Yeah. Of course, yeah, as like any memory, uh, associations develop. It's not just a list of photographs. It, it develops in the course of life, but it's a biological function that the animal may either memory, remember something or not. Now, human memory is quite different. It doesn't really reside in uh, that, that part of the brain tissue at all. That part of brain tissue just plays a, a subordinate role. Okay? Um, we um, know things, we remember things because we're connected to them in our experience by all sorts of symbols. So it's, it's almost like a different function. So when we talk about a person's memory, it's in its biological foundation is something completely different from animal memory. There may be some gorilla who's learnt tricks to remember things, uh, but that's exceptional. He must have learned them off his ear. Okay. 
Yeah, since I'm leaving in about an hour, I think it's oh, now's right. the time. <laughs> okay. Um, it's, it's to go back to your contribution of project um, collaboration mm. and my question. It's, I read, the, I read the chapters in your book. And so my question is, is to help me clarify confusion. My question is, is a collaborative project a unit of analysis, or is it a way of understanding context? Um, or is it the unit of analysis when we want to understand context? Um, yeah. A unit of analysis is a relative term. A unit of analysis is the uh, concept of a whole process. Okay, so for each different problem, if you're going to successfully uh, understand it, you require a unit of analysis. So the question, it's nonsense to say, is it a unit of analysis? Because there's always, in your third option, a unit of analysis for some problem. Okay? Now, is that problem context? Um, well, yes, I think, I mean, I tried to show that, that, that context is a, um, a problematic concept but we nevertheless needed something to explain why people did what they did. And broadly, uh, you want to look outside the immediate environment of an action and the per interpersonal interactions going on there to a wider context. And uh, in activity theory, that is generally called an activity. Uh, as Leontief gradually parted away from uh, Vygotsky's Marxist approach, he referred to an activity. Uh, but he never really explained what made an activity an activity. He didn't say an, of course, because he spoke Russian. He could only say, well, I forget the word, but you know, activity or something uh, without a, a or a the before it. Thus confusing generations of English speakers thereafter that thought that uh, a, a mass you know, or continuous entity, a, a mass noun, could be a unit, uh, which of course it can't. But anyway, an activity. So, I'm trying to give a definite form, you can recognise, to the idea which is posited by Leon Teff, but in my, uh, he did fill it in to some extent, but I think in a way that was unsatisfactory, uh, a collaborative project. It's very close to what, what uh, Leon Teff supposed, because he, he took it as uh, every activity is defined by its object. And what, what you're doing is defined by what you're trying to achieve. And uh, the larger societal units of activity. We're trying to achieve something defined on a societal level, so there's something called objective motives. Now, I, just, I, I, I don't think that leads you anywhere, quite frankly. You know, um, but with the idea of a project is both something that has an objective uh, societal existence and it's sustained by uh, it's the fulfilling of individual needs, and it's objective uh, trying to escape from the, 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 the mess of the subjective or objective motives uh, or hidden or real motives uh, and say that, that a, a project actually realises its motive. You thought you were uh, you know, going to make a free and democratic government, turned out you made a real mess. Right? But that only came out as the project realised itself. So it's a learning process as well. And it's not just an individual learning off someone that knows better, it's a collective process of learning in the real world and discovering things for the first time. It's a social learning process as well. But it is a unit of analysis uh, for, I would say, social life, put it that way. Because not necessarily, the context refers to the context of something. So I'd say a unit of social life. Dominic. Maybe uh, this. But today you're describing um, the child's development, and uh, you quoted something that said um, the final situation of the child or 
or that they had our trailer, it would be somebody who could reproduce the culture. There's a whole list, quite a good list, defining that. And then um, there was something that said the, the social forms the individual. I think it was one of the slides, mm. the quotation mm. of Vygotsky. And then the other day you said, you quoted uh, from the Communist Manifesto, um, the free development of each is the, content, is the uh, condition for the free development of all from the Communist Manifesto, which is actually the reverse uh, order. Isn't it? Well, maybe it is, or not. But, I, I think um, we're looking at the, the same thought there, and in a sense, you, one can really only argue about the priority, can't you? I mean, uh, free so to run oops, sorry, go on. Yeah, I was, I'm asking because we, we looked here completely in, in, an is, in a way that is isolated from um, the development of society at, at the child. And, and, and at some stage you say, well, are there any further developments by, by what he doesn't speculate? Um, but there is a continuity, maybe, this is my question, um, where society now becomes um, uh, the, the, um, the field in which these sort of uh, periods of quantitative change are ruptured by revolutionary... Sure. Um, this sounds like a great question for me to end on. But I'm still trying to pack it in. I'm piling up these uh, aspects that you're raising. So can I uh, reply at this point? Yeah. Um, look, there's two questions in here. Uh, my point was that in the development of a human individual, uh, you know, that lasts you know, something probably less than a century. There's a period in which uh, there's a series of revolutions in the person's life, where they stop being uh, newborn, become an infant, stop being an infant become a, a, a young child, and so on. Uh, up until a point where the end is you know, that they are a, a fully competent member of society. If, for example, they never went through that, like, that may be what the midlife crisis is about, I wonder. If they never went through that uh, crisis of the young teens, or sometimes called the crisis of puberty, that was nothing to do with sex, um, and just sort of went, worked in dad's business, you know, voted for the Tories or whatever it was, uh, married the you know, child in Sweden, and all of a sudden, a certain point in life, what am I doing? You know, and they have their 13 year old crisis and say, this is a load of rubbish, you know, I'm throwing all this out. And uh, the mum says, oh, at last you've caught up, boy, you know, get off with you. That's possible. But um, other things being equal, uh, there's a distinction between the two phases of development, which since you know uh, Hegel, Dominic, uh, the um, doctrine of essence covers that series of uh, development of offices, right? which uh, is all those phases of development, right? where uh, we're separated into different antagonistic aspects, and the different aspects of the whole are all building up. Right? And then you get to the beginning of the doctrine of the notion where an abstract concept is established, comes out of all that mess of struggle and strife. And that's, of course, also the unit of analysis. Right? If you understand a the person, then you, you, you don't go to their family background. You go to their first appearance as a youth. You know? um, uh, and, and in my experience, that's often where you really get to the heart of what the concept of that person is. So you've got all that. But, and then, of course, uh, Hegel says something like, uh, thereafter, each successive concept is this fourth with declared as the same and subsumed within it. So every new development a person goes through after they reach adulthood isn't like a total walk away from what I was before and become something different, but it's included in. Right? You put on layers and layers, you know, you, you begin to get a few battle scars, you know, a few bumps on the corners, you learn that things don't always go like that, you learn to have a bit more tolerance maybe, uh, and so on. Okay? Uh, so it's a different kind of development than what you go through as a child, nothing like that. Now the second aspect of what you say is, you know, what about the larger picture? Is that a fair way of summarising it? Now, um, Vygotsky 
believed that he was in the pro he was part of a project to create an alternative socialist man. He was very uh, uh, his image in the development of the Soviet Union was a gradual improvement to a better kind of human being, and his role in that was to try and uh, fix up uh, some problems of psychology and education in the chaos that's all around him. There's no evidence that I know of that uh, suggests he developed any kind of social theory. Now, while my efforts are directed largely to overcoming the mutual alienation between psychology and social theory, but that doesn't mean you forthwith declare them to be one, of course, and subsume a theory of social development under the theory of the development of individual. But when you read this stuff, you cannot but note that the general concepts and schema that Vygotsky brings to uh, his theory of child development in the early 30s uh, re almost come straight out of uh, various works of Marx and Engels on uh, social and historical development. This whole idea of the contradiction being between the way your needs are met and your needs. That's the central contradiction of any gestalt, any system whereby people's needs are being provided. In a certain sense, the very way that, that the society is living comes into conflict with its needs. Uh, he just translated that very broad idea of a contradiction that comes to a head at a certain point and demands that the system be reorganised from the, the a, a form of production producing the goods that the whole society needs and, and uh, the way those needs develop under that form, right? form of life. Um, the whole idea of the um, change in the parts producing a gradual change in the whole, but at a certain point you can only continue forward by a total rearrangement of the parts, which thereby doesn't change, like when, you, when the worker sees power, uh, they've got the same factories, the same trains, the same human beings that they had the day before, but things have been reorganised. Someone else is in charge, there's a national own, nationally owned, and so on. Now, it just seems to me, <laughs> you read him writing this, you say, man, he's just put down, you know, his copy of, copy of Capital, the Andrew Brunet, or, or, or something. Um, so, but it's only um, uh, copying ideas. I mean, Vygotsky is not a crude person. You know, he doesn't, in fact, his early life is spent fighting against, in a, in a society suddenly set up where Marxism is the official ideology. You've got everyone under the sun bringing forward a Marxist psychology. You know, a quote from here, a quote from there, stick something out of Conrad style and say yesterday in the picture, and now we've got a Marxist psychology. So he's very hostile to anything simplistic. But he immersed himself in a, in a certain literature, which was predominantly, a, 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 well, it was to a large measure, uh, a Marxist literature. He's surrounded in the wake of the revolution, surrounded by, surrounded by people, excited by, motivated by um, the revolution, the ideas of that revolution. Uh, Time? Yeah, I know, I'm just winding up now. Seven minutes after two, throat going. Um, okay, thank you, Karen. Thank you, everyone.
reducing the goods of the whole society and, and, and uh, the way we uh, really develop and develop for form of life. Um, the whole idea of the um, change in the parts producing a gradual change in the whole, but at a certain point you can only continue forward by a total rearrangement of the parts, which thereby doesn't change, like when, you, when the workers seize power, uh, they've got the same factories, the same trams, the same human beings that they had before, but things have been reorganised. Someone else is in charge, it's national owned, nationally owned, and so on. Now, it just seems to me, when you read in writing this, you say, man, it's just put down, you know, this copy, copy of capital again from there or, or, or something. Um, so, but it's only um, uh, copying ideas. I mean, Vygotsky is not a crude person. He doesn't, in fact, his early life is spent fighting against, you know, in a society which is suddenly set up where Marxism is the official ideology. You've got everyone under the sun bringing forward a Marxist psychology. You know, I've got them here, I've got them there, sticks on their head, come on, start and say, yesterday in the picture, yeah, we've got a Marxist psychology. So he's very hostile to anything simplistic, but he immersed himself in a certain literature, which was predominantly, uh, well, it was a large measure. Uh, a Marxist literature, surrounded in the wake of the revolution, surrounded by, surrounded by people, recited by, motivated by um, the revolution, the ideas of that revolution. Uh, time? Yeah, I know, just winding up now. Seven minutes after two, throat going. Um, okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, everyone.